to please start our recording. Um, so friends, just an update. We are recording today's meeting and I will call uh, the Quality and Metric Council meeting uh, to order today. Welcome everyone. Um, let me share our agenda up on the screen. There we go. Um, so uh, we'll begin with roll call, please. And let me get back to the right screen. Oh, let's get people admitted. Thank you. There we go. All right, um, I'll go ahead and uh, call roll. If you could either um, use one of the reactions to affirm your attendance uh, or say here, I'd appreciate it. Uh, uh, Daniel Morris. I'm here. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Sydney Edland. Present. Good morning. Uh, Suda Landman. Here. Good morning, all. Good morning. Uh, Mauro Hernandez, good morning. Here, good morning. Um, Ozzy Tanalalar. Present. Good morning, thank you. And Fred Steele. Here, uh, good morning, David. Good morning. I uh, so I uh, Chris is unable to join us today. He let me know in advance that he was traveling. Um, likewise, Dr. Nash is hoping to join us. Uh, she was on the road today. Um, just a quick administrative note. Um, so we do record these meetings um, and uh, people who have missed previous meetings have asked for the recording. As it turns out, uh, everything in state government is a heavy lift, including something relatively simple like sharing a recording. Um, so um, I'm working on getting our recordings posted to the Oregon Department of Human Services YouTube channel um, private for this group. So um, if you do need to miss a meeting, um, but that is a work in progress. All right. Uh, let's see, having said that, I will go ahead and change screens. Uh, give me just a moment and I'll pull up our minutes and we can begin with our review of the meeting minutes from last time. All right, folks, so I do have the uh, meeting minutes up on the screen. Um, you were also mailed a copy. Um, I think just want to make sure we recaptured our attendance correctly from last time and have people's uh, organizational affiliation correct. Uh, Nicolette, I finally got you corrected on these minutes. I'm so sorry about that. No problem. All right. Um, I'm going to scroll to our review of minutes from the prior meeting. Um, likewise, this group should have received um, a corrected version of the minutes incorporating the changes reflected in the document on your screen. I'm going to scroll again. And I'm going to scroll up again. I'm going to scroll again. Just for a minute so we can see this table. All 
I'll scroll again. I'm going to scroll. I'll scroll again. Another small scroll. And again, Going to scroll. Going to scroll. And again. And again, to get the full table. Again. And one more time to see if we can get our review up. Excuse me. All right. I'd like to open the floor for any uh, clarifications or corrections on the minutes from our last meeting, please.
And again, we've opened the floor for comments to any uh, corrections or amendments to last meeting's minutes. And if there are none, it's appropriate for a council member to make a motion to accept and approve the minutes and someone to second, and then we can call a vote. I move to accept the minutes. I'll second. Thank you. Um, all in favor of accepting the minutes, uh, say aye. 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 Thank you. Um, any opposed? All right, thank you, friends. So uh, the minutes are adopted into the record. I'm going to stop the screen share and get us back to our agenda. Um, Marilyn, admin staff, if you could please have the minutes reflect that Walt Dawson has been able to join us. Thank you, Walt. Good to see you. Good to be here. Sorry, thanks. Yes. Getting the agenda back up. Um, so our next piece of business uh, was to be an update from SOQ Administrator Jack Honey on the quality metrics application. Uh, Jack was pulled into another meeting um, and is hoping to join us later. Uh, here's the information that I have front. Um, the department is still working through the hiring process for the information technology position necessary to bring the portal forward. Um, that position has not yet been posted. Um, so I, I, I confess I'm feeling apprehensive about our data collection period, uh, January 1st through January 31st. Uh, what I understand, and Lynn, please feel free to add additional information or correct me, um, there is a skeleton of our portal that exists, um, it does need some adjustment before it will fit the purposes of the 2022 reporting year. Uh, so uh, it's a it's a little bit of a, a nail biter and hopefully Jack will be able to um, hop in and provide us with some additional information. Um, but that's what I know at this point. Uh, pausing to see if there's any comment from council members or uh, I'm not quite sure what to do at, at this point. Um, we may be in a position where we have to delay data collection as we did in the 2021 reporting year. Um, Lynn, did you have anything to, to add or did I capture that? No, no, you did capture elements. it well. Um, and I think we're looking for maybe different ways to get someone hired, uh, maybe on a temporary basis rather than going through. I, I know that what has happened, at least what I have been told, is that Jack and Lance Pugh, our deputy, have taken that request up the higher up to uh, the food chain, um, but that at this point they still don't have an answer for that being a permanent position. So my hope is that they will hire it as a temporary. We do that more quickly and then can fill it as a permanent later. But yeah, no, that puts it well. We definitely do have to have some of the portal pieces updated in order to accommodate um, the vision and the reporting as you all have uh, requested they do it this year. So that puts it well, David. All right. Thank you. And again, uh, Council, I'm sorry. Everything that I've been able to do, I, I have pushed on and I will continue to keep this at the top of mind. Um, so um, in lieu of that, um, Quick and question. We, oh, yes, go ahead. Fred. David, thank you for the, sir, the good of the order here for all of us. I'm trying to remember, I was trying to pull up as you, were, you and Lynn were talking, the statute. Um, what is the deadline isn't there something in statute, or at least I thought there was about a deadline for uh, when the report needs to be issued? Um, well, you, this, this is Lynn, and yes, the statute does have a deadline of the yeah. end of February or end of uh, January for the reporting by facilities. But then what people seem to wait for is the report that we do in July. And last year, we also had to kick back the deadline because the portal simply wasn't working correctly. And so we had to have uh, that crew. They came in and they they did some changes to it. So we pushed the deadline out a month, but we were still able to meet 
the deadline of July 1 in terms of issuing the report. So yes, there is a statutory deadline for them to report by January, um, you're the end of January, that's true. And last year we simply couldn't meet it, but we still had the final report that explained all the data was still um, in by the very same date that, that it will always be in by, so. I did see you just sent a link here, David. Oh, um, I, yeah, I, I did, team, and I'll, I'll explain here. Let me get my screen back up. Um, so before we move to what I'm projecting on the screen, do we have any other uh, comments or questions about the status of the quality metrics application? It, yeah, so what, what I'm trying to um, just put on other members' minds, uh, council members, as we uh, wait for Jack Honey and his presentation, I'm just kind of wondering if... We as a council may need to uh, write a letter if if this data collection is not going to be, uh, you know, the portal is not going to be available. I'm also, you know, I wanted to double check the statutory requirement uh, for when a report is issued. It just seems like we might, might need to, uh, you know, good stewards of those who have appointed us onto this council, both the governor's office and the legislature. Uh, just to write a letter to them, informing them of the the potential delay and the reasons why. Um, anyway, just something to think about while we uh, uh, wait for Jack to come in later. So uh, it was just a thought that I was having here uh, out of concern. So thank you, David. Yeah, thank you, Fred. Uh, and I think that might be helpful. We do want to keep the governor's office and the legislature um, updated on any delays to the program. Uh, so on the screen, I'm projecting a page from the Oregon Health Authority. Before we dive in, um, I wanted to explain the vision for today's meeting was to uh, assist and educate the council in other data collection projects around community-based care. Uh, this is to prime us for the work that we will do together in December, and that is working through 12 proposed metrics um, and determining whether we select any of those to move forward uh, for consideration um, in future reporting years. Um, to recap, there's general consensus amongst the council members, uh, but it is not unanimous uh, that for the 2023 reporting year, um, we are going to stick with the original five measures and we've determined reporting frames uh, for the 2023 reporting year. The metrics that we will be discussing in December and then future meetings for the Quality Measurement Council um, are uh, measures that may be included in the 2024 reporting year. Having said that, any council member may at a meeting um, you know, move uh, to introduce um, a new metric and propose a time frame, and we can bring that to a vote. Um, once the council votes, uh, we do need to move any new metrics uh, through a rules advisory committee. Uh, so I still need to work on um, a, a document for this group that says, hey, you know, if you want to implement a new measure by this date, we need to accomplish this. I think I'll try and present that in some sort of uh, Gantt chart format, um, but that's generally where we, we said. Having said that, um, we've got three presentations today um, on big data collection projects and community-based care, and I'm going to start with a small fourth presentation. Um, a representative from Oregon Health Authority was not able to be with us today. One of our proposed measures um, has to do with um, vaccinations and acquired infections. Um, and so what I was able to learn from Oregon Health Authority was, first of all, folks, um, I would encourage members of the council and uh, public attendees to grab the link that I put in the chat and maybe save that into your browser. Um, this is where Oregon Health Authority uh, is recording data regarding uh, COVID-19 vaccinations for residents and staff. Uh, this is a very difficult uh, page to find on your own if you're just searching the web. Uh, the Oregon Health Authority uh, website is robust, um, and so I find it helpful to keep this page bookmarked. We'll also include it in the, the minutes to make it easy for you. I, what I understand is that generally uh, the data that we're seeing on this chart, um, it has been updated weekly, um, but the data once it's updated weekly is about two weeks old. So we've got a little bit of a lag. It's not exactly real time. 
Uh, the second thing that I'd point out is Oregon Health Authority is planning to move to monthly updates rather than weekly updates, and I don't have additional information on what the lag um, on the, the real time data will be when those updates on this web page move to monthly. Um, and then finally, and maybe most relevant for this group, um, we're always keeping in mind that our quality metrics data is intended for two audiences. Um, one is the consumers of long-term care products, residents, their families, and other allies, and then also our partners in the provider community. Um, and uh, you know, to that point, we do have facility level data available for um, COVID-19 vaccination. So um, when you click on this tab, and it may be very slow because I'm running a VPN and um, running the meeting here, um, but you can search by facility, you can look by region. You know, I think um, you know, just putting an idea out into the parking lot, uh, the quality metrics program has two years of yes, no data. Um, and you know, in seven months or so, um, we'll have our first year of numerical data. Um, while it is great to have that in a publicly available report, I would like this group thinking about how can we make that information more usable to the public and simultaneously make sure that the information quality metrics program is providing is not conflated in the mind of the public or um, of providers with um, information that comes from the um, regulatory side. Um, and I think that's an important point because we want to continue to re assure providers who are reporting this data that the quality measurement program uh, is non-punitive and non-regulatory and for consumers to make good use of this data as the legislature intended um, I'm hoping we can find a better and more accessible way um, than a table in um, a very long document. Um, and I'm concerned that, that consumers might not actually be able to make use of the data if that's the only place it's presented. So um, just some thoughts there, but I did want to share this website if you hadn't seen it, or again, I mentioned it can be difficult to find. Um, having said that, um, I'm wondering if any council members have uh, comments on this or some of the other remarks that I made. Um, and I see a hand up. Daniel, please go ahead. Uh, hi, uh, thanks, thanks, David. I, I appreciate yes. uh, you you bringing this uh, bring this up. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it. I, I think it's a good example of like it's a great case where there's already data that exists that uh, the you know the health authority is clearly like summarizing you know this in, this information for COVID vaccines. Uh, you know, uh, by facility, uh, I, that it gives me some encouragement that they might also be able to do uh, a similar analysis uh, for other vaccines, other um, uh, you know immunizations, uh, you know from their uh, from their system. Um, and yeah, I I think um, uh, you know it would be great to be able to you know kind of port this information over to um, you know into other systems that people are actually using to look up you know facility information. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I mean, if, and if we can, you know, kind of get it out of the system and, and not have to ask, you know, facilities or ask anybody else to do any additional reporting, that's so much the better. So, um, uh, but, but, uh, but yeah, I, I, uh, thanks for, thanks for uh, showing us this. Yeah, you're welcome. And again, one of the things that I've been puzzling over is we have the long term care facility complaint website, um, and that is a great place for consumers to go to get regulatory information about facilities. I just I, I want to be thoughtful about, you know, if we you know, decide or you know, advocate as a body um, for some kind of dashboard that we think of ways to make sure that, again, we keep regulatory separate from the quality so we can continue to do our job of promoting an environment um, of patient safety. OK, all right. Um, any comment? So um, we do have a public comment period at the end of the meeting, but because we have so many um, guests today, I'd like to pause um, any comments um, from members of the public uh, up to this point. All right. Um, Ozzy, how are you feeling? Are you ready to get going as our next presenter? And thank you so much uh, for doing that. Um, I will stop my share um, and you should be able to share your screen. Of course, thank you for inviting me to share some of our work. Let's see if I can do that. There you go. Um, can you see uh, the presentation yes. screen? Yes. All right. Um, okay, 
here we go. So I'm a council member. My name is Dr. Özcan Tunalılar. Uh, I go by Ozzy, but I am here to present on our project um, titled Oregon Community-Based Care Study uh, as the principal investigator. I'm an assistant professor at the Institute on Aging at Portland State University. Um, and I would like to acknowledge uh, my uh, co-investigator, Dr. Paula Carter, Sarah Dice, uh, my uh, our project managers, um, all our graduate and undergraduate students who have contributed to the data collection and analysis. I would also like to acknowledge our providers, our administrators of assisted living facilities, our staff, our nurses who fill out our surveys, um, APD and ODHS staff who contribute to um, our discussions, our other community partners and industry organizations who encourage their members to participate in our study. Um, so usually I start with defining assisted living residential care and memory care. I will not do that here. You can think of them as defined as in licensure of Oregon Department of Human Serv Services, APD. I'll, I'll skip this slide, um, but I will say that um, this part of the presentation, I will only be focusing on the assisted living residential care and memory care part, but the the, the general study has an, another part, a counterpart for adult foster homes. So if you'd like to learn more about them, we have a separate report focusing on adult foster homes in, in Oregon as well. And there are a lot of comparable questions in, in that report uh, to the ones that I'm gonna present here. Um, so this study has been being conducted since 2014, and there were a couple of studies in 26, uh, 2006, 7, and 8 conducted by Oregon Department of Human Services. Um, so th this line of studies have been going on for a while in Oregon, and our broad goals for this for the series of studies annually is to describe assisted living supply and characteristics across Oregon, describe resident information. Um, including sociodemographics, health characteristics, and health services utilization. And I'll go through a couple of more detailed slides where you know we look at the content of these uh, these questionnaires. Um, another purpose is to compare two data from prior reports, so kind of over time, um, as well as two national studies, so that we can see where Oregon lies in the spectrum of assisted living uh, in the United States. As, as well as um, kind of compare settings uh, such as assisted living with and without member care endorsement uh, to, to better understand uh, access quality and costs um, across these different types of settings. Um, so the eligibility criteria is to be a licensed uh, facility uh, as assisted living residential care. Uh, as a base license, and you all know, there's also the memory care endorsement. So basically all assisted living and residential care communities with or without memory care are eligible to participate in this study. And um, we send out mailed questionnaires to each eligible assisted living residential care facility, um, one focusing on facility level characteristics and one focusing on their residents and resident information. And our data analysis usually involves just counts, averages, percentages, rates, um, and we account for non-response and differential response by facilities using certain um, licensure characteristics such as profit, non-profit, larger, smaller, um, rural, urban, um, um, and, and memory care, non-memory care endorsement. Um, and the facility questionnaire has the aggregated information. So these these questions usually have how many of your current residents are or do um, those kind of uh, uh, kind of aggregated information. And we also collect kind of what are the primary um, sources of payment um, for for your residents. Uh, how many of your residents moved in, moved out in the last 90 days? Where did they go? How long had they stayed at the facility at the time that they left? Um, how many staff do you have? How many employees do you have? How many of them are care related staff um, and different types of staff? We asked about RNs, we asked about activities, we asked about social workers, we asked about non-certified staff, just um, direct care workers. 
Uh, we asked about occupancy, how many of their rooms or units are occupied. Um, and we also asked kind of more perspective or, or kind of subjective questions about the impacts of certain things such as COVID-19. Um, and the resident questionnaire is we asked uh, facilities, we send them a, a sampling tool that they can use to sample three of their residents randomly. And, and we ask them to report on those residents. We don't know who those residents are when the questionnaires, we receive the questionnaires, the information belong to one of three residents, so we know separately. And um, then we compile those records. Um, so everything is confidential on our part. We don't know who the facility has reported on. And, and we in the past in 2016, I think in 2017, 18, we had this larger study where we tested out if this method is working, if administrators are able to sample their residents successfully, and if if focusing on three residents are sufficient enough at the facility level to, to become a representative sample of all residents in Oregon. And you can go back to our previous reports about you know that kind of study design characteristics and we can talk about it more um, but in that questionnaire and you can find it in our report at the appendix we asked more specific questions about each resident's health services use medication use whether they specifically receive staff assistance um, and and uh, the charges uh, to um, the the um, the the amount of charges uh, they pay for to the facility both as uh, base as well as total charges that they pay, uh, among other things. Um, so these the next two slides are going to be from the licensing data that we get from o Oregon Department of Human Services. As you can see, these are the number of facilities. Uh, all assisted living residential care includes um, memory care as well, and memory care only is, of course, only those that have memory care endorsement. And you can see that uh, the this market has been um, growing, um, and um, the um, since 20, uh, 2015, uh, there has been an increase of about 16 percent um, in just general assisted living residential care, but 40 percent increase in in memory care endorsed facilities. Um, and um, about 40% of assisted living residential care facilities in Oregon have memory care component, which is a little bit higher than 25% at the national level. So more of our assisted living facilities have memory care endorsement than, than the US average. Um, and this shows the license capacity. Uh, as you can see, these figures kind of are in line with the just facility number of facilities. Um, uh, Questions. I, I didn't know, uh, Fred, um, if we should leave the questions to the end, if you want to type your question um, it, or I can quick, take them now. Yeah, quick, quick question, Ozzy. Do you know if uh, it, it, a couple slides you've hit now? I've just been wondering if some of the memory care uh, that you're capturing, is it does it include the non residential care settings of memory care? So there's a few that are nursing facilities. I just wanted to clarify. Yeah, at the base, we don't focus on nursing part at all. So these okay. are only those memory care that have okay. as their base license assisted living and residential care. Thank you for that clarification though. Um, um, that is actually a good question. I don't know if the nursing facilities report focus on them, which presumably they do. Um, there is a counter report to this, Oregon State University, Jeff Luck does. Um, so if the council members would like to hear, uh, you know, I. David might reach out to maybe Dr. Jeff Luck and, and see if he would be interested in um, it. Um, so the license capacity again is expanding similarly and you know memory care again is growing at a faster pace than just general assisted living. Um, so and these are our response rates since 2015. As you can see, we have a general trend of uh, declining response rate among uh, this group and in, the, in our last survey it was 55 percent and you can see the drastic decline that occurred during the pandemic although the general decline uh, preceded the pandemic for sure um, now these numbers are somewhat worrying but we account for differential selection and we have enough facilities to do our analysis that it's not that worrying but we would definitely um, 
we would definitely like these numbers to go back up to the peak, which is 70% or even higher. Um, and um, occupancy among this group has declined during the pandemic by about eight percentage point compared to pre-pandemic. Um, and um, I, I, you know, there are there are multiple reasons for this, um, but we'll see how things are going to change um, this year, and we will be fielding our study in in February um, this year. Um, and th these are the estimated total number of um, assisted living residential care and memory care residents. And I put these numbers because we don't really know how many residents exactly live on these facilities. And we estimate this based on the occupancy rate among responding re um, facilities. And we basically project that occupancy on non-responding facilities and calculate a total number of residents. So uh, we think our best estimate is um, is 21,000 as of last year. There were 21,000 total number of residents living in this setting and about 6,800 of them, 6,840 of them were specifically memory care residents. Uh, these are resident demographics separately for from our Oregon study as well as comparing it to the national study. And as you can see in terms of gender, um, uh, assisted living residents are typically women, uh, non-Hispanic white, as well as um, 75 year and older. I think this is a pretty common fact known by a lot of folks. Um, but you can see in terms of gender and race, uh, uh, Oregon assisted living residents are pretty comparable to the nation. Um, uh, and uh, our uh, assisted living residents are um, uh, slightly younger. Than, um, than the national numbers. And, and this is the Medicaid use among um, all assisted living, residential care and memory care residents. And as you can see over time, there has been a slight increase from 41% uh, to 46%. Um, and this number is definitely very different than the nation. And in the US, uh, memory care utilization in um, Assisted living is quite low. I think it was 18.1% in 2017-18. Uh, and that is because um, a lot of states don't have the waiver that we have that, you know, um, to use uh, among Medicaid, uh, Medicaid eligible facilities, um, uh, non-nursing home or institutional care. Um, so that's, that's the main difference that makes uh, Oregon assisted living um, more widely using Medicaid uh, funds. Um, so for non-Medicaid residents, so what we call private pay, we asked uh, what the um, average base and total monthly charges, um, and and these are just the averages for total uh, monthly charges. So this includes the, all the fees that are additional to the base charge. So this is what the residents are paying um, as of last month uh, to the survey. Um, uh, and the survey was conducted in early 2022. So, you know, you might you know, you might think about perhaps adding a little bit of inflation if you're kind of projecting it to the current numbers, perhaps. Um, and th these are the numbers that are excluding. Um, and as you can see, the numbers are very different between um, assisted living, residential care. So this is non-memory care, and this is the memory care part. And you can see, uh, as, as you might uh, guess, you might have guessed, uh, the numbers are very different. Um, and this is cost to consumer. So this is not the cost of producing care. Um, and I, there's a currently a study going on in terms of expenses of caring, uh, like operating expenses of facilities. So these are charges uh, that are paid by the residents. Um, and um, this uh, figure uh, shows uh, where the residents are coming from for the non-memory memory care part. 68% uh, uh, of them are coming from um, uh, home or independent living as defined by, you know, maybe a child or other relative um, or their own houses with their spouse. Um, in memory care, it's much lower and uh, there there is more um, moves into assisted living for memory care from um, from another licensed uh, community-based care settings. Um, 
and um, and slightly more from hospital and nursing homes. And these are the move outs. Um, so these are the move outs that for residents who moved out of the facility or left the facility in the last 90 days. Um, and uh, as you can see, overall 66% of residents who moved out or left the facility um, died. Um, and uh, it was much higher in, um, in uh, memory care compared to general assisted living, non-memory care part. And you know these these have implications in, in terms of end of life care, hospice care, and, and what is being provided in in this setting for uh, to that end. Um, and this is the length of stay, and we separated them in terms of short and long stay. We have more detailed data on this length of stay, and uh, long stay here indicates uh, one year or more, and then uh, short stay is less than one year. Um, and as you can see, during uh, the COVID-19's first year, there was an increase in long stay. Um, uh, there might be multiple reasons for this. Um, we, we speculated it could be um, people didn't want to move their residents out. Um, um, maybe there was a decline in short stay or what would have been short stays, more move in, move outs. Um, folks who wanted to have respite care and whatnot might not have been willing to um, maybe check in in a assisted living during that time. But all of these are kind of speculative. But what we know, there was an increase followed by a, a kind of decrease or um, uh, back to kind of overall trends pre-COVID. Um, so this is one of the measures that we have um, that QMC also has, and we actually restructured it so that it, it is more in line with how QMC has defined um, falls with injuries. Um, and as you can see, uh, about 18% of all residents and 16% of non-memory care assisted living, and then 22% of assist, uh, memory care uh, residents uh, experienced an, a fall that resulted in some kind of injury in the setting. And of all residents who did experience uh, a fall, uh, for memory care, about 40 of them uh, went to a hospital as a result. And then in a non-memory care setting, about 30% of them went to a hospital uh, as a result of, of this injury. Um, so the council you know, can, can think about um, um, uh, I, I guess the implications of, of these numbers. Um, and, and these are um, residents need uh, staff assistance with personal care. And as you can see, uh, most of the residents need uh, uh, bathing and grooming assistance. Um, uh, more of them need dressing. Um, and uh, the least uh, uh, requires staff assistance with eating. And as you can see in each of these uh, kind of ADL, categories, activities, daily living, um, memory care residents definitely has greater needs. And I, I put this slide usually to emphasize the, the, the importance of accounting for, you know, what folks say resident mix in, in measuring different um, kind of different uh, measurement outcomes or, or quality outcomes. Um, uh, this is staff assistance with uh, behaviors quote and quote behavioral symptoms. 43% uh, of residents received uh, staff assistance with at least one of these behavioral symptoms, which are, you know, kind of lack of awareness or ability to orient surroundings. 15% uh, needed staff assistance with wandering and 6% needed uh, assistance with uh, danger or uh, danger to self or other uh, residents and staff. Um, uh, top five most uh, prevalent health conditions, and this is among all residents, where hypertension, uh, ADRD, uh, depression was 42% in this setting. Um, heart disease is 35% and arthritis was 27%. And we asked about, about 17 different uh, kind of chronic conditions in our report. You can find all of them. I'm, I'm not going to go through each of them here. Um, and medication use and assistance is, is one of the kind of ma major uh, staff assistance uh, categories in this setting. Um, 
as, as you all know. Um, uh, polypharmacy was about 50% and we define it as nine or more medications. And this is kind of a changing measurement type. Usually, um, you know, I think nowadays it's also defined as five or more. We define it as nine or more. And 50% of residents um, use um, nine or more medications regularly. Um, and um, so I think antipsychotic is one of our QMC's measures uh, in about 19% of non-memory care assisted living residents. Um, uh, they were using antipsychotics um, in the last seven days. Uh, the relevant number or corresponding number in memory care was 45% of residents. Um, and there is one difference between how we define antipsychotic use and how the council define, and that we are not excluding standard versus non-standard. So this is all antipsychotic use. So this is, you can think of it as the upper, upper uh, bound of antipsychotic use. And the council's measure is probably gonna come out uh, lower than 45%, for instance, for memory care and 19% for uh, this is the living and residential care. Um, and staffing, we also asked about staffing and um, we collected information from 280 um, settings um, and about 9,625 9, staff. Um, about 6,600 of those staff were specifically care-related employees. And <clears throat> we, we define care-related uh, specifically for um, RNs, LPN, LVNs, CNAs, CMAs, um, non-certified um, care aides, um, activities directors and staff, and social workers. And as you can see, 69% of employees' job responsibilities in this setting include direct resident care, and 83% of those who provide care work full-time at, at, at these facilities. Um, and in 64% of facilities, there was at least one unplanned staff absence uh, in the last wave of data collection that we had. Um, so this is the way that we asked about total number of staff or employees that they employ. Um, and you can see this particular measure. So this doesn't only focus on care-related staff, but all the staff and employees that they have. And about 33% of responding facilities had fewer than 25 staff. About, 25, uh, about half of them had 25 to 49 staff or employees. And then about 18% of them had 50 or more um, staff or employees as defined uh, 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 by our question. And staff to resident ratio is calculated as basically we divide the total number of staff at the facility by the total number of residents that they have. And as you can see across all settings, that number was um, uh, 0.73. So they had 0.73 care related staff per each resident. Um, and that number differed uh, greatly between non-memory care and memory care. Uh, we also calculate what we call estimated care hours per residence per day. This is basically a measure to take into account differences between full-time staff and part-time staff. We um, Full-time staff is a measure that I think 35 hours per week, um, and the half-time staff is uh, 20 hours per week um, as, as, as used in estimation. Um, and in the, in the end, when we calculated, um, there is about three hours and seven minutes staff time um, overall per each resident across all settings. But again, it differed greatly between non-memory care and memory care. And in non-memory care, it was two hours and 30 minutes staff time. And in memory care, it was four hours and one minute. Um, there are, these are more detailed in our report that I will post the link. Um, and it is now on our website and we can also send it to, I think it was sent earlier to the, um, to the committee members. It and was, you can, 
<clears throat> yes, thank, thanks, David. Um, there was also a large variation in um, in this in terms of care lighted staff only. You can see um, for the total one, it ranged from like the bottom part was one and a half hours, um, and then the top part was six and and six hours and twenty minutes. So there's a lot of variation across facilities in this measure. <clears throat> um, we also uh, attempt to measure staff turnover and staff tenure. Uh, 66, 66, 67 percent, about two thirds of um, st uh, registered nurses and non nurses um, were uh, working for over six months. So about 33 percent of them <clears throat> were had been working less than six months. And then among nurses, 35 percent of them had at least one RN, RN in the last six months who left and over 90% of them had at least one non-RN who, who left the facility. Okay, I just wanted to point out, we've got four minutes left and we've got a few questions in the chat. Thank you. Oh, almost done. Um, and we also asked about <clears throat> the impact of COVID-19 in facilities. So you can see and go through in the report in more detail. But one of the things I wanted to highlight was uh, our highest uh, item was we had a hard time uh, with staffing, and this includes hiring, uh, training, and retaining staff, and that was 90%. And I know the council's one of the questions we are asking is staff retention. So it sounds like it might be a relevant uh, factor. Um, and this is the link to the um, to the overall report and. Um, this is David checking in. It looks like uh, Ozzy's video might have frozen for a minute. Um, by your back, Ozzy. Okay. I am? Okay. Yes. Um, I, I think I stopped sharing now. Yes, successfully. Okay. Yes. Um, so let me see. Where do you? Oh, okay. I think that the email's question was answered by Regan. Thank you, Megan. Um, what proportion of the total supply are non MCRCS? I can. Um, it is um, sixty percent of of the supply um, are so fifty nine percent specifically um, are non MCRCFs. Um, who is conducting the study on the cost of producing care, and when will that be available? Um, David. Um, Portland State is conducting that study. Uh, Paula Carter is the PI and I'm the co-investigator of that study. Data collection ended just yesterday. Um, and um, we are going to be um, preparing at least an initial slide, I think by early December, but the report might, might be published uh, by early January. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Thank you, Moira. Um, long stay and short stay was um, one year and over and less than one year, uh, Fred. Sorry, I didn't specify that. Oh, David, thank you. Um, are there any other questions? Actually, I do have a quick one. Um, the if, if you I don't know, it'll come out in the data, I guess, but I was just wondering if you've anticipated any changes, if you're even aware of the potential for changes on the staffing hours per day per resident uh, with this acuity based staffing tool uh, that is being implemented this year. Is that something that I'm assuming you guys are aware of as the researchers on this? Yes, um, we actually tried and see if we could utilize that uh, those numbers that were already being kept because we never want to duplicate efforts, you know, and, and we realized that as a matter of um, interface software uh, there, we wouldn't be able to um, we wouldn't be able to get those numbers. Um, but so that's an empirical question, right? We will be looking at this year's numbers and comparing them. And one of the changes that occurred is um, that requirement. So we'll we'll see how it how it goes. Um, I mean, there are other other structural changes. COVID is still you know out there, which may you know labor market, etc. But you know, one of those things will be for sure that change. Yeah. Thank you. 
I, Ozzy, thank you very, very much uh, for the presentation. That is an incredibly comprehensive study uh, that really tells us a lot about the settings uh, that we are uh, trying to gather information about quality within. I, I think, I, yeah, just one point, David, I think what Nicola is saying is, is definitely, um, I think council members can, we can think about how we can utilize, you know, PSU study and uh, in terms of both kind of um, trying things out, kind of piloting them, perhaps, for lack of a better word. And because, um, I mean, we don't want to duplicate efforts, I guess. That's the that's the one last thing I'll say. Um, so I, yeah. I guess I'll, I'll say PSU study is, is out there for council members uh, to leverage. Um, thank you very much. You know, the other thing that comes to mind is you know, we do have a different study um, from uh, Portland State, and that's the Diana Carter study, uh, you know, measuring and reporting quality care and assisted living. Um, I will send the entire report and highlight some relevant sections, um, but you know, just as a, a thinking piece for this group, and I know we need to move to our next presenters, uh, you know, there is a rubric for um, quality care in the white study that's, that's articulated in there are five domains, but then the conversation after that is really insightful, and I think it relates to uh, this group's work, and that is while we as researchers or policymakers can attempt to define quality, um, and again in this table in the white study, uh, person-centered care, medication management, care coordination, uh, resident outcomes, and workforce are the five domains. We also know that those are not the pieces that consumers are generally making uh, when they're when, when they're choosing care, um, and so as a group, I think we look at um, the nexus between our metrics and quality, um, and we want to make sure that that is a strong relationship. But I think in order for the work of this group to have meaning for consumers, we need to find a way to help consumers get access uh, to our quality measurement data. Um, and it occurs to me, and we can talk about this at later meetings, um, that perhaps some outreach to hospital discharge planners, um, in addition to looking at how we internally present data, uh, may be rich ground to actually assist people in making use of this project. So I, I digress there a little bit. Um, our next speakers, and I'll put the agenda up for just a minute and then allow our, our next group. Um, we actually have three speakers. Um, so um, we uh, will be hearing from Reagan Sheely, Leslie Otto, and Jennifer Gleason um, on an ODHS bed census and workforce survey. Um, and again, I'm so grateful for these presenters to help us understand uh, you know, some of the information about staffing and bed availability uh, that will inform our work as we evaluate new metrics for inclusion in the quality metrics program. Having said that, uh, I will allow one of our presenters to grab control of the screen. So I'll stop my share. There we go. Thank you, David. Thank you. Leslie is going to run our slides. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Reagan Sheely. I'm a project lead for APD. Uh, we're going to give you an overview of the nurse crisis team because it is uh, directly related to our bed capacity workforce survey that we've been conducting. Um, go If you go to our agenda, Leslie, it'd be great. Today, you're joined by three members of Rachel Kearns Henry's Strategic Initiatives Unit. Um, Myself, Leslie Otto, who's a senior analyst, and Jennifer Gleason, who's our strategic nurse consultant. I'm going to give you an overview of the nurse crisis team and how it's evolved over the past 15 months uh, and how we're transitioning to longer term solutions. Uh, Leslie will talk a lot about our data monitoring and evaluation plans and then how we've adopted uh, data driven processes and framework development specifically related to bed capacity and long term care facilities and workforce needs. So we've got a lot. We, we should, let's move on, and I'll talk a bit about nurse crisis team, how we've transitioned from a reactive to a proactive model, and then we'll move on to Leslie and and Jennifer. Uh, jump in whenever you see fit. So I think uh, I, I'm. I believe most people in this group are familiar with the nurse crisis team, but going to give you an overview going back to August of 2021. This staffing support model was established uh, as part of the joint ODHS OHA incident management team that responded to COVID-19 outbreaks in long-term care facilities. 
It was initially structured to support hospital decompression and has morphed into uh, a more proactive medium term, long term solution for long term care facilities. Uh, with each surge, the NCT scaled up to support uh, long term care facilities with staffing crises and COVID-19 outbreaks. And it still remains a safety net for those types of uh, those types of missions, and it also supports facilities in equity and capacity preservation. It's a proactive interagency collaboration that works to preserve beds uh, and in some cases build capacity to mitigate risk for displacement and support patient rights. We've also built out a, a realm of stability and workforce support in the form of a med tech training backfill program that's been pretty successful. It was implemented this summer. We'll talk more about that later. And then also providing workforce supports in the form of nurse consultants that can go in and support facilities in various uh, quality assurance and quality building uh, initiatives. Let's do next slide. Um, so this tells the story visually going back to September of 2021, where we were OHA in particular was running the staffing vendors and preparing for the Omicron surge, which as you can see in January had 80 uh, COVID-19 safety related missions alone. Uh, toward the end of Q1, the state funded decompression units and COVID-19 recovery units were drawn down. The nurse crisis team also reduced in uh, clinician numbers from about 450 at its height to about 150, I believe. Those are round numbers. Uh, and then as you can see in the middle of this year, we transitioned and went into post-crisis stabilization. The nurse crisis team staffing contract transitioned from OHA to DHS. And on the right, there are de-identified snippets of uh, each type of mission, just a mini, mini case study there. Jennifer, I know you can add some context here as well. Yes, absolutely. So just to underscore what you're looking at on the left side was really the demand. And this may have been same facilities that reached out for multiple reasons, if you will. It may have been one where they were capacity building and then had an outbreak. So this again on the left is reflective of the demand. The right side are actual types of admissions. And we have a lot more data in terms of um, by mission type, uh, the type of support we've lent, uh, the days on site, and so forth and so on. But this, I think, gives you kind of a broad brush of what we've covered. Yeah, thank you so much, Jennifer. Uh, I'll just jump in for, for the next slide. So uh, my name is Leslie Otto, and I'm supporting the team with understanding our frameworks and how we're collecting data to show our results. So, to just give a quick um, overview, we uh, looked at uh, what kind of results we are trying to achieve at every level, starting from we have NCT backfill staff up to our impact level of hoping to improve patient safety and wellness for the APD populations needing long-term care from the ongoing workforce shortage crisis and everything in between. And so by developing a framework to really understand the results at every level from inputs, activities, outputs, outcomes, we were able to um, focus our, on our safety and sustainability strategies and formalize uh, a monitoring and evaluation effort, uh, effort to leverage data and prioritize our resources so that we are making data informed decisions. Um, and so we continue to uh, review and refine. Um, and so just a quick uh, like share, like an ME plan, monitoring and evaluation plan is is taking those results and saying, what does it mean to understand those results? Um, what does success look like at every level? And so this is just a quick table um, showing our monitoring evaluation plan for our med tech backfill program um, that has been going under review so that we can finalize and begin reporting on that. Um, and so some of those results, we have already begun doing this analysis of, of what what work we are doing. These are descriptive statistics, um, nothing, no sort of like regression analysis. But for example, our workforce support missions, we are just trying to understand and monitor what are we doing? We've had 27 facilities that have received med tech backfill missions since its inception. We've trained 159 med techs. And, and as of October, we have 15 more facilities that have shown interest in the program. 
Um, and so we are trying to help and support facilities with um, providing them a backfill so that they can train up uh, med tech, especially given that we know that med tech medication error rates are in the top reasons that a long-term care facility may receive a citation. So this is really trying to support the needs we've been seeing. And this kind of goes back to the transition from this, uh, from a COVID response and leveraging what we've learned during the COVID response to see where those gaps in workforce and understanding uh, how we can better provide care to our APD population in the longer term. Um, but before I do that, I do want to say we do have, before I came on, we hadn't really collected any data. Uh, well, I should say that. data was definitely collected, um, but I was able to go back and grab a Center for Medicaid and Medicaid Medicare and Medicaid Services data for their nursing home uh, data set, which is required on a weekly basis for nursing facilities. I know the CBC focused on this call, but we are able to look at trends. And I took out the facilities that we responded to with NCT capacity building missions in 2021 during the Delta surge. And we saw just pulling out the 10 facilities that did receive support that before uh, we intervened, there was on average a decrease of 4% month over month in the census that they were able uh, to carry. So they were identified as high need facilities um, and the nurse crisis team was deployed. And you can see during the time that they were deployed, the census did increase. We are not saying this is causation, but we are showing there is correlation between um, the nurse crisis team being deployed and a census increase. So here you can see that um, we were able to preserve the beds, the decrease in beds stopped and afterwards, after the drawdowns, facilities were in a better place to continue to support a higher census. We did this again with uh, the 2022 capacity building missions. And this again is the CMS data that we were reviewing. The green line on the left in the graph is the nursing facilities that received uh, capacity building missions in 2022. Uh, the purple line is all nursing facilities uh, average of their mean census over time. So that we used as kind of the counterfactual, if you will. But you can see that the um, the, the facilities that were targeted for these missions uh, did have a higher census overall. So they do have different traits than those of all other NIFs that um, were used in this in this review of. Uh, of what was happening. And then uh, the blue line is all the nursing facilities that does remove the facilities that received support. And so the 2022 missions did show not only a maintaining of those capacities, but an increase of about 4% or two more residents compared to the month prior um, during the month of February to June. Interestingly, we see drawdowns happening. And so you see that decrease by May and we see a decrease in census, and we notice that we also had the highest number of admissions at the same time in that month. So this indicates likely high churn. So the facilities had the capacity to both take on new admissions while also um, uh, discharging patients at the same time. So we were able to serve a larger number of, um, of APD uh, consumers. So, all of this was happening and we had begun to um, actually I'll hand this over to to Reagan. Sorry, she is the, the master of this, this slide. So I'll hand it over to you, Reagan, to, to bring on the workforce survey. Thanks, Leslie. Um, again, with, as with all things, uh, our survey efforts have been an evolution. Uh, if you could go to the next slide, Leslie. At the in September of 2021, uh, DHS dis, uh, administered through our internal department, O'Ray, uh, a survey on bed census 
via the Alchemer platform. It had a fairly standard survey participation rate across long-term care facilities of about 35% every week, and it was sent every Monday. That continued throughout Q4. In January, uh, strategic initiatives team took over administering it. We did it through our Qualtrics platform, again, stayed weekly. We did add workforce questions in the form of workforce uh, vacancies by position, RN, LPN, CNA, MedTech, caregiver. We had, again, a fairly standard participation rate of NIFs around 44%, CBCs about 34%. In October, we realized our data needs shifted from needing them at a steady clip weekly to more of a quarterly need, but a more complete data set. Um, we did targeted outreach in various areas, uh, and I, I want to thank Nicolette and Kristen for helping us get the word out about the Bed Census Workforce Survey. Our big push in the first three weeks of October was to get the highest amount of participation that we could, and then we would suspend the survey to the end of the year and move to a quarterly survey model in 2023. Uh, we also adapted the questions. We made the workforce questions that was shifted to an FTE uh, metric as opposed to a position, an open position metric. And we started to ask detailed patient denial uh, questions. The actual survey questions are in the appendix if you're interested, but I don't want to bury the lead here. Uh, we had 100% NIF participation and 85% CBC over the course of three weeks. So we've already started planning for 2023. Uh, this is a great springboard for Leslie to talk about all the amazing data monitoring and evaluation that she's done with this nearly complete data set. Uh, we will keep you updated on, on our survey efforts, but are planning to do a quarterly survey again. I'd love to get that CBC response rate up to 95% um, over the course of about a three week period. Again, we, uh, we think this model works for us. So that's what we did. Leslie, show us all your all your cool M and E. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks, Reagan. Yeah, so so with those results, uh, we well with the with those respond responses, we were able to make some initial findings from from those responses. And uh, this is just a quick overview. It's been it had been thought previous to this survey that hospitals were struggling to decompress because we didn't have enough beds along with the substantial workforce challenges that we've continued to see through various data sources. Um, what the findings found, in fact, were that there are actually a lot of open beds. Uh, that was not the reason that we were seeing denials. That is not the reason, uh, uh, that was not the challenge. Uh, specifically, there were staffed open beds reported in all regions, including Medicaid open beds. Um, there was also a high denial rate uh, rate across all facility types with Medicaid referrals and beyond staffing constraints, which was one of the reasons for denials. Uh, we saw a high level of acuity issues. Um, that was actually the highest reported reason for denials, complexity of care for consumer needs, insurance, payer issues, and of course, um, like we said, there are workforce shortages. So, so that was an aha moment, and we continue to dive into the denial reasons and more to come on that. But on the right, you'll see kind of a, a level of concern map by region and some, some key findings that we pulled out that we thought we'd share with the group and has actually already been shared what, more widely. Um, but like I said, staffed open beds at the NIF level, um, high level with, uh, with region two and seven showing um, that open beds per facility was uh, had an average of one or two open beds, which was lower than the other regions. Um, mean facility vacancies per facility, we did see that all regions except five and nine had more than five full-time. Have vacancies. you advanced past slide 14? Are you seeing the results? I'm still seeing slide 14 and I don't, I want, Oh, You're yeah. talking to match this, the visual this, for this group. This, this is slide 14. Okay, good. Cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, so so as you can see here, so we saw that there was a high number of vacancies in every region, and then the denials relative to open beds. Uh, we've had some hotspots, and then we, we did a little bit more in the denials, um, specifically denials due to complexity of care of consumer needs was high in all regions. And um, and that was based on the denials because of acuity 
over facility. So red meaning 15% or more uh, denials were, were acuity related, which we said was high concern. And then Medicaid denial referrals was over 50% in regions one, five, and one, three, and five, and nine. So with that, I uh, just want to make sure I don't miss anything else. Uh, so those were our key findings. Um, going on a little bit more into the open beds, as I know that's what uh, this group is also interested in learning about. Uh, so we had overall three over 3,000 open beds. And when we say open beds, we're saying they're currently staffed and available for admission. This is not opportunity beds, which we would define as bed, the physical beds that could be opened if we had staff. So that was that was interesting uh, to say the least. And then we also saw that uh, there was over a thousand admission denials. Um, and like I said before, we were doing more digging to really understand uh, those denials and how we can support those. But that's about one in three. There are three open beds for every denial. Um, so again, it's not the open beds that is causing uh, discharge delays at the hospital or um, denials at the long-term care facility level. And then for a workforce focus uh, of the review of the results, we had just general overview of vacancies by region. So here you can see the total workforce vacancies. RN, LPN um, had the lower uh, end, which makes sense because this includes NIFs and CBCs. Uh, CNA, there was over a thousand. That was really high in CBCs uh, rate than it was in other, uh, than in NIFs. We pulled that out. MedTech and caregiver, sorry, CNAs was a very high, high vacancy rate, specifically in nursing facilities, while MedTech and caregiver, those, um, those vacancies were higher in uh, CDCs. And then we did a rate, so we tried to compare, because we understand Region 1 is going to be Multnomah County. That's going to have significant higher population, so more facilities. So in order to control for that, or at least to make it more comparable, we did a rate where we took the number of vacancies by over the number of facilities in that region. So you can see uh, on average, there are about 0.53 RNs vacancies per facility across the regions. There's uh, same with LPNs. And then CNA, there's about almost two uh, CNAs vacancies per facility in all regions. Well, sorry, overall with regions one, two, three, six, and seven having the highest over one vacancy uh, on average report per facility um, and sit similar with med tech. And then caregiver across the board has over two, um, two vacancies per facility uh, across the regions. This is in line with other findings that we've seen. Um, this, this didn't come too much of a surprise to this group, but this is um, also being reflected in our workforce survey. So we had the key findings, um, the initial results were trying to figure out, OK, how do we make this uh, inform the current programming? So this is just a quick, I won't go into detail on this, but we are, we've been taking those workforce results and informing our priority targeting amongst all of the different uh, uh, emergency board uh, projects that came out in, I believe it was uh, September. Um, and so here you can see the nurse crisis team uh, how we're using the workforce survey to inform where we're targeting. We also have other programs like the discharge incentive payment program, clinical and caregiver training, and distress provider relief fund, um, and identifying red being these are priority regions for targeting. So with that, I'll stop and see if there are any questions or, um, or comments. Uh, hi, this is Sydney um, Edland. I'm the uh, the chair of the council and I'm with the Patient Safety Commission. Thank you so much for this. This is so interesting and so helpful. Um, I do have a question for you. I tried to write it down so that I could like, you know, coherently express myself. Um, so I'm thinking about this data in terms of the difference between data for policymaking versus data for individual choices. And I'm wondering, based on everything that you've looked at and these experiences that you've had in trying to help facilities meet these needs, et cetera, is there anything that you feel like consumers who are making individual choices should know? Like, what is, is there anything in here that if I were going to help my parent 
choose a community-based care facility, um, that is there something in this data where it it might not be something that I as a consumer necessarily think of, like, oh, that's important. Um, because I know that like, and this data might not be that, this data might be really policy level data. Um, but I am curious if that's if that's something that you've thought about or you would have any recommendations on. Yeah, th this is Jennifer. I can help to at least in part um, speak to that question. And one of the things that's always top in mind and really one of the key drivers is how we even got it stood up was all around the workforce shortfall, right? And I, I think what we've gleaned from here is we've been able to quantify at least in one like global snapshot across you know a really high response rate, what that looks like from a full-time equivalent, right? So it's a type of quantification that I think uh, most states don't have. And it really kind of speaks to the, the level of gap, if you will, because those gaps can then speak to some of the chronicity in the problem and the magnitude at the facility level. So we, we are delving more into the details of what that looks like and how to inform that going forward. But our plan is also to trend that over time, right? And then look at what the key drivers are. Some of the things that have not um, maybe jumped out in this presentation, but where we spend a lot of our time is really tying it back to the end game, if you will, the safety, the quality. So there is quite a bit of dialogue that we're doing in part with our framework in terms of looking at existing data and then trying to prioritize, if you will. So, so that's data that we're working on that I think always speaks to consumers, right? How safe is it? What's the error rate? What's the type of error rate? What's the leadership turnover? Because we are finding as we're in there trying to help rescue during a crisis or pre-crisis or post-crisis and stabilization, it comes down to leadership, right? Mm. What's the stabilization of the leadership? And, and really what's the caliber of the leader that's there? We are finding um, kind of anecdotally, because we've been in hundreds of facilities talking to them at the ground level, of what are your pain points? And we, we partner largely with our SOQ team, but we are, just so that we're clear, we are not SOQ. So oftentimes these facilities will share a lot of detail with us that they typically will not with anyone else because we are just simply here to help, right? We're here to help. And so there's a level of candidness that they're sharing with us and on what they really need. And we're, we're not only trying to pivot and be responsive because we are now piloting some workforce support that is focused on the CBC nurse, recognizing that that is such a big, big, big role. I mean, I cannot underscore. I, I personally have been a resident care director of large systems in big urban uh, cities on all campuses, and I've also been one in a, an ALF and memory care. And I will tell you the former is much more intimidating. And that's from a 30 year veteran nurse who's been across the nation, much more intimidating. And so what we're seeing and hearing at the ground level just kind of plays out again and again and again. And through our dialogue with the nurse consultants that are often mandated to go in and support the plan of corrections with these facilities that we're here trying to provide the workforce so we can get that plan of correction some forward motion. We are, again, we're at the crux of like, where can we, where can we help them? Case in point, here's an illustration. We had one with a huge diversion problem and we found out that it's because their med techs don't learn how to uh, narcotics properly. They weren't using their uh, point clicks properly. They didn't, they weren't doing those three-way checks. And so we're finding, you know, kind of global system problems where we can intervene, we can be thoughtful about it. And then what we're also trying to do is measure, right? For each type of mission, we deployed X doing these sets of key activities. And what do we see was the impact on the plan of correction? And therefore, our hope is over time, where do we move the needle with the med errors since in part why we stood up the med tech? And some of you are probably wondering how did how did the nurse crisis team, and I say quote unquote, because so that you all know this, uh, we, we're under the nurse crisis team, but we're also the operational team that supports Rachel Corrin's Henry and all of her initiatives. 
So the we call it the DIP, Discharge Incentive Program, um, other programs where the same team supporting her. So there's a lot of crossover and connection. But point of this is we, we, we hear, we see these are long-term chronic problems. Our, our nurses need better training. Uh, that's in part why it's an intimidating role. We don't want to stay. And it played on the study we just saw, the turnover rate, like a third of the nurses are turning over because the role is just so huge, right? If you're the only licensed person in this big, in this big body work. Um, so so I, I don't know that I answered your questions specifically, but I think I'm touching on all the points that, that matters the most to consumers and their family and their loved ones. Uh, hey, Jennifer, uh, David, the program coordinator, I wanted to make sure that something you said got captured correctly and that I understood you. Uh, you Sydney generally was asking, hey, you know, in your work, have you learned any things that might be important for consumers as they go about making a decision on which care facility to select? Um, and you said something that really struck a nerve with me, and that was quality of leadership. Um, and tenure of leadership. Um, I'm wondering, would it be a fair statement um, to say, hey, you know, if you're looking at things that indicate quality that consumers can make ready use of, you might consider measuring the length of uh, tenure or years of experience of the facility administrator or facility nurse. Is that a fair restatement or is there some nuance that I might have missed? Yeah, th there is a nuance and thank you for that call out. So I would say anecdotally, what we've learned is the facilities that had more tenured leaders that have been in position without any vacant positions or turnover um, bounced out of those crises easier. What we find, because we are in facilities with extensions, right? We're in there, we can't draw down, we can't draw down, we can't draw down. We may have placed the team there for capacity building and it's just been a painful drawdown because it, now they're in a short staffing crisis or what have you. And we find that ha not having a nurse leader there, a strong nurse leader just has a huge ripple effect. And we also do hear that anecdotally with the nurse consultants as we're in the planning, and post-deployment phases of, of our mission. So anecdotally, we heard that we don't have data that speaks to that. The only data we have today at our fingertips is one snapshot in time of what the gap in the workforce is at the full-time equivalent level. Um, thank you, Jennifer. And I see Fred has a question. Yeah, thanks, David. I was wondering if uh, one of you could elaborate on uh, what you're looking at going forward or how you're going to be looking at that um, distinction, as, as you mentioned, uh, from uh, the denials based on the complexity of the residents' needs versus the beds, the open beds. So, you know, anyway, I was just wondering if you could elaborate on how you're looking at that issue. Yeah, that that is a great um point because this this was a huge pivot for us right this was a, like a new discovery for us with the workforce survey and it aligned just a little bit of backbrush it aligned with what we're hearing at the ground level and specifically specifically with nursing facilities for capacity building because so that you know when we deploy a team for capacity building we are checking in with them every week and saying where are you getting denials how many did you take of the ones that were referred, which ones did you deny and for what reason? And so this survey was really just a snapshot of the data of everything we've been hearing. And what we hear are there, there, there's too many behaviors for our facility. You know, they're, they're, the complexity of care, it might be someone who is a diabetic with a wound who needs lifting support. And, and in combination with some socioeconomic problems, it was just too much for a nursing facility to take on. And so we kind of already knew this from day one, but now with the data that we're faced with and our preliminary results are showing a, a pretty significant Medicaid denial rate. And part of that, I'll just say it was a flaw in our survey. We didn't ask everyone for their total referral, so we couldn't give you a total denial, but we did ask them what was your total Medicaid referral and therefore we could, we could calculate a rate. And then when we, 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 we asked them the opportunity, right, tell us why, why you're denying. And it provided us with categories and some themes that we've been able now to, to 
bubble up, if you will, right? Primarily to Rachel Curran's Henry to now prompt additional discussion. So she's she's already she's asked us to go back and do more data. And so we are, you know, actively still very much looking at the data. Um, we have not gotten to the point where we've, we've done any type of validation and verification, if you will, but it is prompting different dialogue, if you will, in terms of what does this mean, right? How do we make sure that the demand, we, because now we know, right, we have lots of open beds, but they may not be meeting the care needs for the people that need those beds. And so it, it is prompting different discussions beyond our group, if you will. And, and then real quick, the, when you say Medicaid denials, are you talking about residents who are on Medicaid or eligible for Medicaid being denied a bed? Or are you saying, you know, maybe those transferring out of the hospital being denied by uh, the state system that they're not eligible for Medicaid? Yeah, it, yeah great distinction. It is the former. So I'll, allow me to be, be okay. clear. The question that we asked in the survey was, nursing facility, uh, do you have an open bed a medicaid bed if yes did you get a referral if you get a referral did you deny and if you denied that referral for what reason and jennifer further clarification when you're asking about do they have a medicaid bed i'm curious how medicaid bed is defined i um, i think almost all um, of our beds in Oregon nursing facilities are duly certified for Medicare and Medicaid. So technically, you know, the vast majority, like 98% of our beds would be Medicaid beds, but I've also observed that facilities oftentimes internally designate beds that they would prefer to use for Medicaid patients. Was that distinction made in the queries of providers? Yes. So the way that we uh, made the discernment was whether or not they uh, were contracted for, for Medicaid, right? If their facility, not specifically mm -hmm. if you had a, a X number of Medicaid beds for admission. It was if the facility itself was accepting Medicaid. So it wasn't truly about the number of licensed beds that could accept Medicaid. It was more the facility's internal perception of what beds they would dedicate to Medicaid consumers. No, it was really more at the designation at the facility level, because not all facilities accept Medicaid. Yeah, I don't know what the percentage is, but I know it's a, a preponderance, like in the high 90s is my recollection. A, a, of nursing facilities, and I, I could be wrong, but. Maybe we should leave that for now. I can talk with you offline. Sorry. OK, no, no, we can certainly calculate that for you based on our, our source of truth and our, our data that uh, okay. comes from the SOQ team. I also think, too, for this committee, remember that our focus is specifically on community-based care, community-based care metrics, and all of this data, although it is wonderful data, um, we would probably need to extrapolate this SNF, the nursing facility data, and focus specifically on the community-based care data, specifically for this group anyway. Yep. But yes, Nicola, absolutely. Um, are there any other questions for our presenters? Um, and I'll draw the group's attention to Ozzy's comment um, about the paper on um, the number of deficiencies by administrator tenure. Um, I think that's fertile ground for us to look at. Thank you, David. I can also send the paper to you and you can forward it. I can I don't think I can share here. It looks like I can't send uh, files. No, that, that's difficult. But yes, if you would please share with me, I will share with the group. Absolutely. All right. Um, well, Council and Public, I think we are just a little bit past due um, for our break. I want to um, thank um, Reagan and Leslie and Jennifer. This was really insightful and important for this group to understand. Um, I feel like I captured the tip of the iceberg and I look forward to digging into the slide deck uh, to, to see what, um, you know, everything that, that is there. Um, thank you Perfect. so much for your time.
All right, um, so folks, what I'll do is it is time for a 10 minute break. Uh, we're going to uh, cut into uh, Dr. Bauer Leffler's time just a little bit, but uh, you know, his remarks are really to help us focus on the work for the December meeting. I'll go ahead and throw a timer up on the screen. Let's please reconvene in 10 minutes and thank you everyone.
She won't let me hold. She All right. Hello, everyone. I'll give people just one more minute to get back. I did not start the timer as I intended, so it's 10 minutes ish. Uh, and I'll manage. Let's see here. Actually, just so you know, David, I, I did see a timer. Yeah, no, there there was a timer. It just wasn't oh. started. I came back after uh, grabbing some tea and noticed I hadn't started it, so I gave us five oh, minutes. Okay. And oh, I tried yeah. to give and it us... was it, it was counting down, and then when it stopped counting down, it reset itself to one minute. Um, yes, but there was a delay in the start, Sydney. I didn't oh, start okay. it. Yeah, thank you so much, and I'm sorry, folks. Um, so Dr. Nash has a question in um, the chat. Was there a change to next month's meeting date? As far as I know, the answer is no. Um, our routine is to meet on the third Thursday and in December that falls on the 15th. Um, so um, please help me out if I'm in error, but otherwise I think the answer is no. Yeah, it was scheduled, it's scheduled for the 15th. David. Thanks, Marilyn. Sure thing. Thanks, everybody. I appreciate it. Um, well, folks, we will go ahead and resume because, again, um, we've cut into our time just a little bit, um, but I am very pleased to have one of my fellow policy analysts over at Oregon Department of Human Services, uh, Dr. Simon Bauer Leffler. I'll let him explain his um, background um, just a little bit, but one of the things he brings for this group is um, a specialty in metric design and specifically uh, metrics that are designed in a way um, that support the respondent in getting us the information we need. Um, having said that, Simon, the floor is yours. Um, if you have anything to share, please do. Otherwise, um, oh, actually, I will put up um, our criteria for metrics. Um, <clears throat> And again, to set the stage here a little bit, this group has, um, over the course of its work, developed a list of criteria for evaluating potential metrics. I ran this by Dr. Bauer Leffler um, to see what insights he had, and he had a few suggestions for the group's consideration. So bear with me and I'll pull up his comments and we'll talk through those. So uh, uh, good morning. Thank you to the council members for having me today. Uh, just a little bit about my background. Uh, my doctorate is in uh, sociology, specializing in uh, research and uh, statistics. So for the past 15 years, I've been uh, 
all around the nation designing uh, data collection systems specifically for uh, various state governments, uh, natural national programs, that kind of thing. So my focus is uh, designing data collection systems to get data um, that is uh, easy for respondents and then uh, actionable for um, analysts. So that's that's really what I focus on. And uh, David showed me the uh, metric criteria that uh, the council put together. And I just had a couple of thoughts. Uh, I've been doing metrics for a while now. And uh, I specifically just wanted to add uh, three just kind of common pitfalls that uh, um, you sometimes see in metrics. I know I've seen them over the years, and these are just things that uh, sometimes happen. Uh, so um, the first one, making sure that the proposed metric goes beyond uh, standard operating procedures. Uh, I've seen this before. Um, a uh, organization puts together a metric for, for instance, uh, all employees are paid on time. For example, uh, almost every organization is going to have that metric at almost 100%. So it's not really necessarily informing anything. Uh, it's not going to help them improve a process or anything like that. Uh, but it looks very good. You know, the metric is almost at 100% every single time. So the metric itself looks good, but it doesn't, it's not actionable. So uh, you uh, want to pick metrics that are actionable that are going to change, that are not uh, standard operating procedures. Uh, the second thing I, uh, pointed out was um, if you can pick something associated with a behavior or incident that can be counted, so as opposed to an opinion. So uh, as we all know, opinions uh, can change hour to hour, day to day, you know, so if you ask somebody's opinion and they've had a bad day, it may be very different from uh, if you ask them a week later, whereas if you count uh, whether or not they fall, for instance, um, that is a specific behavior that you can count over time. So uh, if there are behaviors or incidents that can be counted, that's a great thing to go with. And then a um, uh, third thing and the most common example of uh, um, modifying a behavior with uh, negative outcomes used in metrics is um, buses running on time. So uh, if you have a metric of you want all your buses to run on time and you do, you know, get the buses uh, starting to run on time, but there's a lot of pressure to get all the buses running on time constantly, the bus drivers might start running red lights, might start, you know, not stopping at stop signs, that kind of thing, to make sure that they hit uh, their stops on time. So there's a point to where um, you want to make sure that the metric is good, achieved, but you don't want the metric to encourage bad behavior at the same time. So these are just common pitfalls of metrics that uh, I like to um, point out, you know, uh, make people aware of whenever uh, we go into a metric process. And uh, these are things that uh, I suggested to uh, David as part of an inclusion of the process. So. Uh, thank you, Simon. Um, so I'm wondering, while we've got this slide up with the three notes um, from Simon, um, do we have any questions from members of the council? And again, we're trying to get into um, the space where we can 
really review the proposed metrics and come up with things where there's a good nexus with quality and we're choosing metrics that will be of value to consumers and to providers in their effort to improve quality care. Uh, so any questions for Simon? Um, while we're thinking about that, I'm going to um, display a different document. And Simon, I'm, I'm going to ask if you have any uh, comments on, um, I'll just project a list of the proposed metrics, but um, you know, it, it's a fair answer to say no. I'm putting you on the spot, but if you had any insights or um, thoughts on these proposed metrics, give me just a moment and I'll make sure I've got the right document. Um, so hopefully you can see we've got this list of uh, proposed metrics here um, and based on your feedback to us today, um, do you have any comment um, on any of these that, that might help us as we evaluate? I think you're on mute. Thank you. Uh, these metrics uh, are behaviors or things that can be counted, which is uh, great. I would like to see that. Um, I uh, there's some definitional work. Uh, for instance, uh, too long on the first one. Uh, we would need to define what too long means in that case. Um, let's see here. So, uh, and then I wonder if we have data for some of these um, measures already in the system or to what extent we may have data for some of these. But um, yeah, um, going to my third comment, um, I, my first thought would be um, number of group activities for residents. Um, my one of my worries would be is um, could a facility uh, just call the enter a group activity so they could count it, you know, or uh, you know, kind of back to that bus thing. Could you take a activity? that you're already doing and just call it a group activity to meet the metric. So, um, but so definitions are incredibly important here. Incredibly important. Yes. Uh, definitions are incredibly important in research. Yes, absolutely. But uh, same thing with resident to resident bullying. Uh, what counts as bullying? You know, uh, and then uh, what counts as bullying, who is counting it, yeah, <laughs> uh, that kind of thing. So these are things um, you want to think about. And then um, you also have to think that uh, facilities are reporting this, so obviously they would like to not report bullying, you would think. So uh, depending on the definition, uh, are there ways that they can use that definition not to have to report certain incidences? You know, so uh, based on this definition, uh, Gary shoved Paul, but Paul didn't fall down, therefore it doesn't meet the definition of bullying, therefore I don't have to report it. You know, mm. that kind of thing. So, um, so yeah, it's just uh, uh, definitions are very important. Um, thinking about uh, perception, 
and um, I don't see any of these that are just part of standard operating procedure, except for um, I could see somebody uh, potentially using standard operating procedures in the guise of group activities. So, right, yeah. Uh, you know, one of the challenges the group faces, I think, is you know, our efforts are designed towards measuring quality, uh, mm -hmm. but I don't think that there is a universally accepted definition uh, yeah. of quality. And you know, just naming that is one of the challenges we face in trying to select metrics that are helpful to our intended audiences. Yeah. Well, and then um, I'm looking at the vaccinations, influenza, and that kind of thing. Um, I assume residents have a choice whether or not yes, you they receive a vaccination. Too. So you wouldn't expect that to be a hundred percent. So in addition to um, counting uh, vaccinations, you would need to count vaccination refusals or vaccination uh, opt outs to get a good metric in that case, I would think so. Dr. Nash. Yeah, so. Um, yeah, I think I would agree that this it's very hard with this list, right? What you'd have to say is catheter um, catheter used beyond X number of days, and then you'd actually need to know medical like there's different ranges, like what's too long in person A may be not too long in person B. So you need to know, you know, so so I think this list is not like infection. Like, what does that mean? There's. Yeah. yeah hundreds of thousands of different kinds of infections. Um, pressure ulcers actually. They're technically called pressure injuries and not pressure ulcers and some of and there's terminal pressure injuries, which are related to people near end of life. And so anybody who is in palliative care may very well have those, but normally in quality metrics, you don't count those. So I do agree, like the definition is everything. Um, as far as I can tell you what we do with vaccinations, um, we, we count number of people vaccinated and then we count number of people who were offered a vaccine. Okay. That's uh, how, we, you know, but I think, so what you would really, yeah, so I think um, to really benefit from um, Mr. Bauer Leffler's expertise, one would actually, he would, we would need to have actual measures, you know, like yeah. were, were we going to use some of the standard bullying questionnaires, for instance? Right. Okay. Yeah. I'm also wondering, Dr. Nash, if I, you know, is vaccinations the indicator of quality or is it number of vaccinations offered that's the indicator of quality or number of opportunities? So th those are things we can explore. Um, you know, we may be in the general domain, but need to close in on the thing that is the actual indicator of quality where, you know, residents have agency about whether or not they get vaccinated and perhaps maybe the more effective metric of quality is how many opportunities do people have or what was and, the length of education around vaccinations? I'm not sure, but respond. Well, yeah, and and note that we're not talking about nursing homes. So there is no, like you could have, you have 500 beds in an assisted living, you could have 500 different PCPs and the assisted living building has zero authority to require a PCP to order anything. Um, and so, I, I think we have to remember we're talking about community based care here and not nursing facilities. And so some of the things on this list, I think, are much more appropriate for a nursing facility where you have a medical director and and you actually have federal rules that come down and and um, control some of these variations, whereas in community based care. Um, you're taking care of a very different audience um, than you are in a nursing facility, and they have different problems and challenges. And are we are we looking at 
the quality of care available to residents of Oregon, or are we looking at the quality of care provided by community-based care? Because those are two different things. And the assisted living or adult care home or residential care facility has a, a subset of things that they themselves have any control over. Yes, thank you. I uh, let's see, Leslie, did you have your hand up still? Uh, uh, no, I put it down and I just was putting my thought in the chat, but we were running into this, these questions when we were looking at understanding what the NCT was doing, what nurse crisis team was doing. And, and for other programs also, to be honest, we that's why developing a results framework or a logic model kind of helped identify what metrics you want to be collecting so that you can say this is the result we want and we can say that we've met this result or that we're responding to this result by this indicator so these mm -hmm. these metrics are at all different levels some of these like catheter left in a bladder too long that's that is an output or an outcome result or i should say indicator of of what of quality of care but i think if you're able to define what quality of care what that looks like to say this is how we're defining it, you're going to get a lot more clarity about what is changing over time and, and where there might be gaps and where you might want to make decisions. But that was, that was just thought. Okay, thank you. Um, Mauro? Thanks. Um, I'm just a reminder, I mean, and I've, I think I've brought it up a couple of times, there's a very large body of research, researchers that have been focusing on quality and assisted living for decades that have been looking at which measures um, and evaluating existing measures and, and their use. And I feel like we should be focusing on, rather than coming up with new measures that these folks might have found to be lacking or not setting appropriate, um, that we should be focusing on the literature on quality measures and assisted living at some point um, as we're you know, so sorting through this list. Uh, so, uh, Mauro, is that is that to say the the literature com review component of each of these measures is essential to the effort, or do we need to pause? Well, I, ha and, I have to pick wonder why up? wouldn't we be looking at the, why would be looking at these other measures that aren't necessarily being used or tested, or or researchers aren't necessarily using for m looking at quality and assisted living, rather than what what has become pretty standard in studies that look at quality and assisted living. I'm Daniel. Yeah, I, so um, I, I guess just a couple of thoughts. So first, um, you know, like when I filled out the, uh, you know, the document with the, uh, uh, you know, to submit, you know, my proposals, um, uh, what I, I guess, I guess what I think is like, I feel like people are maybe getting too hung up on like the the title of, of just the line in here, but uh, you know what I certainly try to do in in my proposals is uh, is identify other places where these metrics are being collected uh, and uh, and how they're being defined. So things like um, uh, like long term catheter use. Uh, uh, so I, I do think that there's like a we we have. Uh, you know, some established materials that other, uh, you know, that that actually are being collected in other places that I'd, I'd like to, you know, consider. Uh, the, m my understanding is that, you know, many of these metrics are or have been collected by CMS for skilled nursing facilities and that it is, uh, you know, appropriate and good for, uh, for this group to, to consider adopting those, um, uh, you know, basically expanding the collection of that data to cover CBCs as well. And, you know, with like respect to uh, Dr. Nash's point, uh, I, I think that like without, I, I, I again, I, I keep, I, I guess I keep hearing these some like claims that just seem somewhat like anecdotal, but, um, but I actually don't know that, uh, you know, if, if these assumptions about the differences between the the care and um, you know uh, 
and you know and and so forth are are actually different between the the CBCs and the skilled nursing on on various measures, and and that's why we want to collect the data, right? So um, and uh, so anyway, but th those are just some initial thoughts. But I guess the maybe maybe more to the point here, uh, while we have our guest, is just wondering like. Uh, as this group is going forward, looking through the detailed submissions around the uh, proposals and um, and other you know literature that we review, uh, you know how are we are we going to be getting support from uh, from like our guests today or from other um, uh, you know from other folks to um, uh, you know to actually make sense of of uh, looking at these other examples and these other details to uh, to kind of like help us work work through it together instead of just like responding to just the title of the you know on the on the table here. Thank you. Uh, Daniel, I got, I'm going to think on that one for a moment and allow us to move through our queue of comments. Um, Simon, you are next. Oh, uh, I was just going to say. Um... I was prepared just to speak to the uh, uh, three suggestions that I made to the um, uh, metric process as just kind of a um, thought exercise uh, kind of going into metrics. Um, in general, uh, if I was guiding a metric process, I would absolutely recommend starting with a definition of quality, reviewing the relevant literature, uh, going with uh, that process and then developing metrics out of that. Um, but that was kind of beyond what I was prepared for today. So um, yeah, I, I think uh, there's a larger discussion to be had there. Uh, um, which, th thank you for that. Yeah. And I, I think what we're seeing actually is some of my my newness uh, to the project and in, in, in trying to guide the, the metric selection process. Simon, um, th thank you. Um, Sydney. Yeah, um, I just I want to say number one, thank you, Simon, for your input. Um, that's super helpful. I think some of these are things that we've tried to articulate in our criteria um, and that uh, that it's, I think some of your wording may be more straightforward or more plain language, and that might be helpful. So I really appreciate uh, your input. I think that's going to help us in December when we start to have these conversations. Um, and I did want to just remind everyone that we haven't defined these measures. We haven't decided we want to measure them. Daniel's absolutely right. There's a whole conversation that we are planning to have in December around this. Um, I do think there's increasing evidence that having more of a logic model and kind of a shared vision for what we're trying to accomplish with this is necessary. Um, it's it, it I think it would make things easier and we may that that may already exist in terms of what the statute has set out as the goals for the program. Um, but I think kind of coming together and coalescing around that uh, shared vision is going to be important. Um, and then tomorrow's point, I do think that um, it, we should absolutely use nationally tested measures um, and that we'll get into those discussions in December, that I don't think anybody's planning to like look at these items and um, and not use what's already available if if we if this is somewhere we want to go. But that's also something we have to do is evaluate. And Moro, since you do have more experience with this, um, I am I'm very glad that you're on the council and that you can bring that expertise. Um, and that Ozzy can bring his expertise and that Dr. Nash can bring her expertise to these conversations so that we can really um, make sure that we are we are oriented in the right way. Because another piece of this that I keep hearing come up is, well, if we're doing this measurement, if CMS requires it for SNFs, we should be doing that for CBCs as well. But the infrastructure for data collection is wildly different. And I think that that's something that that's a key component that we keep coming back to again and again as well. Like what's actually possible in the CBC setting and what takes that building of infrastructure before you can actually get that data. Because as we as we heard about earlier today, uh, staffing is a real concern in this setting. And if we're asking for data that because there if there is no minimum data set and there isn't a good electronic way to collect all of this and just like export a spreadsheet, then you're putting an initial burden on staff that is away from resident care which is the opposite of what we want to happen. So I think that that's really critical. So we're not, um, 
I think that we can't just wholesale adopt CMS measures without that deep consideration of what, of what the costs are to the facilities. Um, so those are the things that I thought of as we went through this. I, I am really very, very grateful to hear from Simon about some suggestions for how we can think about our, um, our criteria for measurement. I think it's wonderful to know that you are um, a, a, at DHS, that we are, that, that you're a resource that we could turn to potentially. Um, that's like excellent news. Um, and I am very, like these presentations, David, so fantastic. I am very, very excited to have this conversation in December because I think it's going to be very good. And I think that we are all kind of coalescing and aiming in the right direction at this point. And I think it's going to be, um, it's going to be a very exciting time. Um, th thank you, Sydney. I, so folks, I'd like to um, reserve some minutes remaining for public comment. Um, so if uh, you are here and you do have a comment, uh, please raise your hand or take yourself off mute and we'll uh, receive those comments in turn. Um, and Daniel, I want to make sure, did you, have, did you have anything else that you wanted to add before we pivot to uh, public comment? Oh, no, I don't. I'm not sorry. All right. Thank you. All right. Um, hello, Barbara. I see your hand up. Go ahead, please. And thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I do just want to underscore what what Sydney just said too is or maybe a different aspect to it based on our experience with with live well. And that is um, that it is vital. I mean, the whole reason for doing this is to improve the quality in these facilities. So the data collection, the purpose of the data collection is to do something with it. So it's vital that staff understand and that they are bought in. And I was thinking as we've had this discussion, we've got these great five metrics. There's been so much training on them. People are engaged, people get it, and they want to collect that data. And there's also lots of opportunities for going deeper into each of the existing metrics. So that was, was just one reaction that I had. I think it's the new measures. I mean, they'll be whatever is selected will be, I'm sure will be fine, but there's a lot of potential in deepening the understanding and the changes that come about with um, the, the metrics that are currently there. And then the other thing that I just wanted to share was 2016 to 2018, we did a lot of data collection with 40 of our pilot facilities with support actually from the Institute on Aging, oversight and support, and it was super hard to collect that data. But one thing we noticed was that when we gave the communities an opportunity to choose among, you know, a list of potential metrics, um, we, we had them do basically these same five, plus they could pick one or two. They really liked that because then it allowed them to tailor their, um, their uh, their their measurement and tracking to the things that were current and pressing in their own community. So I just wanted to share that. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Barbara. Uh, and again, um, we've got some conversation occurring in the chat if you haven't had an opportunity to be there. Um, and we note that uh, you know, use of physical restraints um, is just something that is not allowed at the assisted level, living level of care. Um, so um, yes, I think, Simon, it could be argued that use of physical restraint could be an indicator of proper care. But if that was happening in an assisted living facility, it would indicate that person was in the wrong care setting, um, just because of how that care setting um, it is defined. Um, I'm you know, surrounded by other experts. If people have other insight on that point, please speak up. But um, I thought I would at least start us there. Thank you, David. This is Suda. Um, I have been um, basically copying and pasting, um, you know, part of the rule. So the rule actually um, says that restraints are not permitted except when a resident's actions present an imminent danger to self or others. Um, so just wanted to bring up that nuance. Um, secondarily, uh, there are, in fact, specific examples where um, supportive de devices having restraining qualities are, in fact, permitted. I've also placed that there. And one example, and there are a few examples, but I just provided one example, which is when a resident specifically requests or approves of the device. 
and the facility has fully informed them of the risks and benefits associated. So just pointing back to the OAR in terms of um, restraints. Thank you. Uh, once again, pointing to the importance of definitions, you know, one year. Uh, so just a raw count of use of physical restraints might not catch that nuance or, you know, uh, uh, might need the additional definition there. So. Yeah, and I don't think anybody's proposing just that. Like these are much more complex oh, yeah. measures that yeah, have been suggested. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's obviously I'm just, you know, uh, I'm I'm talking about the uh, uh, discussing the concepts of metrics in general, or yeah. All right. I uh, well, council and public, we are near the end. Oh, Linda, uh, please go ahead. Um, just to the point on you know providing information for consumers. Um, I think that like so many things in our world. Um, it's very complex, it's very holistic, and, you know, I think this set of measures is going to be one set of information that consumers used, and it was um, designed to give sort of a cross-section of multiple quality indicators without making it 50 different things. But, I, you know, I also point to the fact that, you know, we have a pretty robust consumer guide developed in this state. We have consumer disclosure informations. There's mega websites on how to select long-term care. So I think that, you know, not that this is the charge of the council, but there might be a way to really put a comprehensive consumer page together where all of this information can be accessed because we have the DHS compliance information. So, you know, unless you're pretty savvy, you would not know where to go look. And I just don't, I, it feels like sometimes the conversation is like we're trying to solve every single issue with the quality measurements. Um, so I just put that out there. Um, I also have just a general question. Um, I was wondering if the 2022 report um, was completed. Uh, finalized and posted yet. Um, I haven't seen it, but I didn't know if it was maybe posted somewhere else or it's still pending. Uh, this I, is, this is ahead, Lynn. Let me address that one as yeah. Uh, it, it was done on July 1 and sent to our legislative staff then. Um, th we've had turnover all over the agency, I think, with our legislative folks. And so I do not, I just checked this morning myself, it has still not been posted there. Um, so we're posting it instead just on our own website, but it is done. And uh, and yeah, both the compliance report, which is not a part um, of what this group looks at, but was originally part of the same statute that created the Quality Measurement Council. We, however, have now separated those into two separate reports, one dealing with quality measurement, the other dealing with compliance uh, uh, data that we would have taken action on a facility for in the in the year that's being reported on. So we do have both reports done. They were done on time and they're still not reported. And I agree with that, but I can actually probably send them to folks. But maybe I can drop them in here. David. Um, so we can't we can't drop them to external partners in the chat. Um, so for anyone that's interested, I can email you uh, those reports quickly. And also um, in my project of bringing our public facing website um, up to compliance with public meeting laws and making it a good source of information, um, both of the 2021 reports are in the queue to be posted with SharePoint. So I expect those up certainly by the next time we meet, hopefully um, in the next week. Um, and then, uh, you know, just to Linda Kay, your point is well taken, and that's exactly the way um, I am thinking um, is that, you know, it would be really helpful to consumers to have a single source where they can get consumer guides, where they can get um, consumer summary statements, where they can have access to quality measurement program data, uh, where they can link to uh, the facility complaints database and, and regulatory data um, is really something that, that would be helpful. So thank you for highlighting that. 
And I want to underscore that, that David really has been bringing that issue up, is that we need to have one place where residents could go, family members find data, get at, and know where they could go and understand it easily. So, um, yeah, it's, it's he really has been pushing for that. I think it's a great idea. We're going to see what we can do uh, to get the agency and our program to accomplish that. Um, so, Council, um, I have as our, our last agenda item a preview of the December meeting. Um, I had an impression at the beginning of our conversation today that has evolved over the meeting today. Um, we had set for ourselves the task of evaluating um, the 12 metrics at the next meeting and had discussed a process uh, to accomplish that that might involve um, a hybrid in-person um, electronic meeting. Um, I, I think that may be premature at this point, and I just uh, beg the uh, council's patience while um, I staff the agenda for our December meeting um, with council leadership and anyone that is interested, uh, but it seems like we might pause um, and do a review, have a conversation about quality, um, existing literature, um, and a shared vision. Uh, so if you'll please bear with me, I'll work with council leadership uh, to clarify our goals uh, for the next meeting. Uh, and then before before we close the meeting today, uh, you know, any, any final thoughts uh, from the council or council members? Uh, many thanks to our guest presenters today. Um, Ozzy, thank you for presenting the Portland State Study. I learned a lot. Um, you know, for Reagan and Leslie and Jennifer, thank you. Very insightful. And Simon, we really appreciate you being a resource for us. And I am 100% positive we'll be calling on you again. Uh, folks, our next meeting Happy is. Help. Thank you. Uh, folks, our next meeting is scheduled for Thursday, December 15th. Hope I'm saying that correct. I am. Um, we have set this meeting up as a recurring teams meeting, so the link will remain the same. We will have a running chat. Um, Dr. Nash, um, I'm going. The the process for posting a recording um, is incredibly difficult. I will figure out how to accomplish that. And forgive me, there are many tasks that I'd like to achieve for you that I'm not able to do on my own. So it's like a, a very long chain of dominoes, but we'll work through it. Thank you everyone for your attendance and engagement today. Um, reach out to me before the meeting if you have um, ideas for improving the quality of the meeting or developing the agenda. And otherwise, I will look forward to seeing all of you on December 15th. Uh, thank you very much. Hi everyone. Bye. 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 Thanks, David. Thank, thank you. you.